Well, greetings from Melbourne, Australia. It's good to be with you for this Kairos Summit. You know, when Jesus launched his missionary movement, he stepped out of the wilderness and he announced the time is fulfilled. This Kairos time in the purposes of God has arrived and it's never left us. And he proclaimed the kingdom is present. The time has come. Repent and believe the good news. And this message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he says, it's going from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And wherever it goes, the fruit is always going to be disciples learning to obey the Lord Jesus in communities that are reaching their cities and their regions in depth. So for such a time as this, finishing the task the Lord has given us, we're here together. And just to sort of help us understand this whole concept of the Kairos moment of God, I want us to drop in on Paul in the Mediterranean Sea. And he's being buffeted by ferocious storms. It's been going on for 14 days. They haven't seen the sun during the day or the stars at night. And, and some very experienced sailors have decided this is the end. There's no hope. We've chucked all the rigging overboard to lighten the load. We're trying to get rid of the cargo. And, um, you know, the soldiers are uh, just sort of planning when they're going to execute the prisoners. Because if, if somehow they make it to shore and all the prisoners aren't there, those soldiers will pay whatever sentence that prisoner was going to have received. So Paul's life is on the line. The lives of 276 people on board. Sailors, soldiers, prisoners. They're on the line. Now, how did he get himself into this trouble? Well, by obeying God. By taking advantage of the Kairos moment in his life. And, you know, this is one of the first things you realize in the life of Paul or of Jesus. If you want to be in the purposes of God, you better expect some trouble. And God had called him to go and take the good news to the emperor in Rome. That emperor happened to be a guy by the name of Nero. And he told him, you're going to get there, Paul. Now, Paul's intention was, you know, I, I'll go to Rome after I've been in Jerusalem and then build the relationship with the church there and we'll partner together and then I'm going to launch the movement in the western half of the empire out of Spain, the Latin-speaking half, because the eastern side, the Greek-speaking side, you know, we've got churches now all throughout that wide region along the major trading routes and they're reaching their cities and their regions in depth. So there's no more place left for me in the eastern half. I'm, I'm headed to the west via Rome. That seemed like a good plan. That was the call on his life. But this sense of foreboding came over him as he was leaving Ephesus and saying goodbye to everyone, saying, this is what I'm going to do. And he's writing to the Romans, so here's the plan. And he began to be aware that things were going to be tough when he arrived in Jerusalem. And the Spirit began to say to him, Paul, you're going to face suffering, you're going to face hardship, you're going to face imprisonment and arrest. But Paul said, well... Even when God sent him a prophet, Agabus, to warn him, Paul said, I'm, I'm going. Because, I, I, you know, since, since Jesus rescued me, my life's not my own. I'm going to walk into trouble. And so he departed from those believers in tears. Knowing, not the detail, but knowing something awaited him in in Jerusalem, and that's what happened. He's almost torn apart by a mob there. The Romans came and rescued him, took him up to Caesarea where they've got their headquarters. 
And he just sort of sat in prison for a couple of years, wasting away. Different governors came and go, uh, went. Um, who we got? We got Felix, we got Festus. And they bring him out every now and again and have a bit of an inquiry. And uh, King Agrippa came with his uh, Queen Bernice, investigated. No, this guy, you know, he's probably innocent, but we, we want to send him down to Jerusalem because uh, we don't want to upset the religious leaders down there, even though we really should set him free. And Paul knows they're coming after me. If I go down to Jerusalem, there's a high likelihood I'll get killed on the way. We'll be ambushed. So he says, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus says, well, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And he puts him on a ship with a centurion and a detachment to guard him. Paul's chained. He has got Luke and Aristarchus, one of the believers uh, that, that he's won to the Lord in, in Thessalonica. They're traveling with him. They got permission to do that and probably paid their own way. And in chains, Paul is headed for Rome. But Instead, he's in the middle of the Mediterranean with 276 people and the storm is about to sink the ship. They've given up all hope. So Paul stands up. I mean, he's a prisoner. What, what right does he have to address his guards and the captain and the ship's owner and all the crew? these sailors and tell them what to do. But he just stood up and said, well, guys, I told you we, we shouldn't have left harbour. We should have, you know, wintered back over there because we've run out of time and we shouldn't be on the sea. You know, he knew this was a crazy plan to try and make it to Rome uh, as the winter was closing in. Now, before they threw him over for saying that, he, he went on and said, but, you know, last night, an angel of God came and stood by me and affirmed to me, you're going to Rome, you're going to get there and you will testify before Nero. And he also promised me that not one of you will be lost to this storm. God is gracious and he's going to rescue Every single one of us, although the ship will be lost, because I told you not, you know. And that's what happens. You know, uh, when they ran aground, as Paul predicted, off a sandy beach in, in Malta, just south of Sicily, that island at the boot of Italy, they ran aground in Malta, and those who could swim, the centurion Julius said, OK, go for it. We're not going to execute the prisoners. We'll trust them not to escape. And then those who couldn't swim, they grabbed a bit of wreckage, jumped into the water and 276 of them made it to dry land. And God had answered Paul's prayer. This was his Kairos moment. Now, Paul's plan was a nice, leisurely trip to Rome. It wasn't imprisonment, it wasn't riots, it wasn't shipwreck. He was promised those things, but that was not the plan. And I don't think any of us plan some of the events that take place in the world today. Stuff happens. Bombs go off. There are riots. There are pandemics. There are elections that shake us all up. Where is God in all of this? Well, he's working out his purposes. You think about the God who is revealed through this whole episode. He's the God who preserved Paul from a mob intent on tearing him apart in Jerusalem. He's the God who gave him favor, gave Paul favor with Roman officials. Now, sure, they left him in jail for a couple of years. 
but Paul was wheeled out from time to time. He got to present the gospel to these Roman authorities and a Jewish king and his queen. Paul was there, in, uh, God was there in sending Luke and Aristarchus to be with Paul, giving him the centurion Julius as the one who would escort him to Rome. And Julius was good to Paul and on at least one occasion saved Paul's life. So God looked after Paul and along the way, he had permission to drop in on believers in places uh, like Sidon and then when they made land, landfall in, in, on, on the mainland of Italy. And he got to encourage the believers. Paul got to Rome and he was under house arrest. Again, chained to a guard. I think this went on for a couple of years. So he's now spent more than four years in chains. And he wrote to the Philippians and he said, I want you to know what God has done. Since I've been here, sure, under house arrest, but chained, the gospel has been going out. In fact, the elite Praetorian guard are hearing the gospel. These are the, the, uh, the soldiers who are loyal to the emperor and protect him in Rome. And now the gospel is spreading through the Praetorian Guard. In fact, the gospel is going into Caesar's very household. The slaves and servants and administrator that look that, that apply the policy of government. This is Caesar's household. It's not just his cousins and his friends. Some of those are there. But these are the people who run the empire. And the gospel's going to them. And Paul says to the Philippians, because I'm in chains, God has emboldened the believers in Rome and they're proclaiming the gospel all the more. So this is the God who reveals himself in power through our weakness. This is what God does in the Kairos moment. None of us rise above the Lord Jesus. God is at work in the Lord Jesus because of his humble submission and obedience. He wins the battle in the wilderness just as Paul is winning the battle in the storm. You know, because... When Jesus had triumphed over the enemy in the wilderness, it says in Luke that Satan left Jesus for an opportune time, for the right moment to come back and try again. That was Satan's Kairos moment. So God has his Kairos moments, his moments of opportunity. And they're typically in the thick of the battle who do you think is trying to sink the ship with Paul on it? The enemy is at work. Who's put it in the heart of those Roman soldiers to execute the prisoners before they can escape? God is at work and presents that, prevents that. So in every Kairos moment, God has his plan and purpose. And the enemy is at work to take advantage of it and bring us down. How do we triumph over his plans and purposes? We do what Jesus did. We do what Paul did. In our weakness, we surrender. We obey his word. We depend on the Holy Spirit. And we stay the distance with the core missionary task that he's given us to do. The gospel to the ends of the earth. Disciples, churches, multiplying everywhere. So this is the God who is at work in this Kairos moment. What sort of person is Paul? Well, when it becomes clear to him, Paul, it's not going to be a very easy time for you to get from Jerusalem to Rome. And you may or may not get to Spain. We're not sure about that part. 
But you will get to Rome, Paul. Just my way is different to your way. And Paul says, okay, Lord. Since Jesus rescued me on the Damascus road, I am no longer my own. I will entrust myself to your care. Even in the lion's den. Even in prison. Left to rot for two years. Even in chains on this ship. Even in the storm after 14 days. I'll trust you as I grab a plank and jump overboard and try and make it to that sandy beach in Malta, which you can still visit. It's on the south side of Malta. I think they call it Paul's Bay or something like that. Paul trusts God's promises. And God has promised that Paul will stand before the most powerful man on earth and bear witness to the Lord Jesus. And Paul says, that's good enough for me. Somehow I'll get there. No matter how things appear, somehow this mission will be fulfilled. Now, if I was running E3, and I had a guy like Paul on staff. I have a few men and women a bit like Paul. You know, I'd be helping them make good plans, which is Paul, what Paul did. He made a good plan for getting to Rome and then on to Spain. But God overrode Paul's plan. And God's plan doesn't make sense. I'm going to have my best guy on the planet in jail for two years and then facing death in the midst of a Mediterranean storm. And then, to really impress Nero, I'm going to have Paul in house arrest, chained up for two years in Rome, and then he can stand before Nero as a prisoner, just as Jesus stood before Pilate. That's how God works. Folks, he could do it with all the power and might he has. And one day he will wind up history in power and in authority. And he will reveal his awe shattering glory to the world. But right now the kingdom is hidden. Hidden from those who do not want to believe. But revealed to those who who want to cast themselves on God's mercy. And you might think, what a poor use of a guy like Paul. Paul says, no. I got to rescue 276 people. They all got the, <laughs> the gospel. Everywhere I went, I'm encouraging the believers. And when I get to Rome, all the believers are encouraged. All of them are... Because Paul's chained up, but we're going to boldly proclaim the gospel throughout this great city. And every few hours, a, a different soldier is going to be chained to me from the Praetorian Guard. And the gospel's going to go all the way into Caesar's household. And maybe I'll get to Spain, maybe I won't. But it's not about Paul. It's about this dynamic word of salvation proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit, not just by Paul, but by men and women, young people, children, different ethnicities. It's going to the ends of the earth. And it doesn't matter if I'm in a Roman prison or if I get to Spain. It's going to happen because Jesus rose from the dead and he still leads the way. His word, the power of his Holy Spirit and this core missionary task, you know, this message for the forgiveness of sin, for repentance and the forgiveness of sins, this message about the Lord Jesus is going to get to the ends of the earth. Do you want to be part of that? Do you want to be there when it happens? 
help make it happen. And it's going through people like Paul, but also an Aristarchus and a Luke and Priscilla and Aquila and all sorts of people. We've never even heard their names. And then the end will come. And everywhere this word of the gospel goes, there's going to be disciples and communities, people learning to follow and obey the Lord Jesus and to reach their region, their city in depth, and then partner with apostolic leaders who are taking it to the next unreached field. You know, what is this Kairos moment? I tell you, this Kairos moment is Africa. I don't know if there, I know, I know some of you are based there or are, are supporting and coaching and training the brothers and sisters throughout Africa. It's Africa's day all over that great continent that's headed for, I think, over a billion people. The word of God is spreading. Lives are being transformed. Africa is alive with the gospel. India is alive with the gospel. North India there, Nepal, Bhutan, these places, places we don't even know, are alive with the gospel. One of the great missionary forces of our lifetime is the nation of Brazil. Because there are movements throughout the Latino world that will put us to shame. China, India, Sri Lanka. In 1400 years of the history of missions to the world of Islam, We've never seen multiplying movements until this generation. This is a great Kairos moment. And you might think, well, what have I got to do with this? Well, think about Paul. He's just one guy. One frail guy could find himself on the bottom of the ocean. I drown to the glory of God, I go to Rome to the glory of God. Either way, to the glory of God, and I get to be with Jesus for all eternity. They're the sort of people that God uses. And so you may be in your Kairos moment, or you might just feel like, no, I'm not anywhere near it. Be encouraged. It's not up to us. We don't control world events. We don't control pandemics. We don't control civil unrest. But God is in control. He's chosen us as weak as we are to display His glory in our weakness. This treasure of the gospel is in this earthen vessel, this clay pot. This is how God works. And we get to be a part of this great move of God across the face of the earth from now until we reach the ends of the earth and the end of history. Praise God.